everybody time to compose themselves. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions first and then open it out to you guys. So I also want to bring up uh, Noah Swartz. I'm going to start with a question about this work and your previous work. What is it about technology and the people who make it and devise it and play with it that attracts you? Uh, well, I think it's one of the one of the key kind of questions of our of our time. How how we relate with our technological tools? They can be um, amazing and they can be uh, they can be awesome and they can be awful. And I think it's smart to kind of look for for both sides of that. Um, yeah, I, I made a, a, my previous film was We Are Legion, the, the Story of the Hacktivists, um, which was about anonymous. It was a very, very different time, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it was about a time, um, uh, you know, two years ago the world was on fire with protest, and, uh, you know, the, the, the diplomatic cables, the Afghan war logs had just been released, uh, the PayPal 14, became, what became known as the PayPal 14, that conducted... Uh, um, Protests against massacre of visa and PayPal when they cut off sort of financial services to WikiLeaks. Tunisia touched off, the Arab Spring touched off, uh, and uh, a group called Anonymous <laughs> uh, uh, kicked off what they called the Summer of Lulls and the Occupy Movement, and uh, Time Magazine called it the Year of the, the Protester. Uh, I would say the year after that was the Year of the Crackdown, uh, where the pendulum swung in a rather dramatic fashion. Uh, in the other in the other way, and and was revealed a kind of crackdown on whistleblowers, leakers, hack, hackers, and hacktivists of all kinds. It's a much darker time, uh, and I think this reflects that. Uh, in some ways, I feel like this is a, another part of that same story. Um, I'm sure you guys have a lot of questions, so if we can see you, can you see? Who can you see? Right there. <laughs> I'm going to repeat the question, so... Well, yes. There, there are microphones, right? Can't they line up at the... Oh, great. Perfect. Yeah, line up at the microphones. So, thank you for this incredible film. I am... I was really moved by many things, but in particular the role of educational institutions like MIT in limiting access to information. I'm the dean of a law school, and as the leader of an educational institution in the legal industry, I was curious what you... Uh, any advice, I guess, or thoughts you have about ways that we can um, improve access to information as opposed to the examples in this film of limiting that access, particularly in the legal industry? Do you, you think a lot about this? <laughs> um, I, say. I mean, there's lots of ways, but I mean, one of the things Aaron did earlier in his life was try to free a lot of PACER documents and donate them to the Internet Archive so that anyone can have access to them. And the Internet Archive now is a program where a number of there's a program called Recap, which is designed to help people get access to PACER documents. So when someone would go, I don't know how much of it was in the film, if any. Uh, yeah, we briefly mentioned that. Yeah, when someone goes to download a new PACER document, rather than paying the lookup fee, they can search the Recap database first and get free access to it if someone has already bought it. And my understanding is that there are, you know, lots of people who have large stores of PACER documents that they've already paid for that they could donate to a system like this so that anyone could have free access to it. But then there's doing what MIT claimed to be doing, which was giving anyone on campus free access to the journals that they have access to. But if that was more commonplace, then maybe it would be looked on better by... I mean, I think I've never met a researcher, uh, uh, an academic, uh, Structure of any kind who hasn't published something that won't, doesn't want people to read it. So this idea that um, that f federally funded, you know, taxpayer res you know, money goes to research and that that research isn't available to us is absurd. So I think it should be protested at every stage of the process. Hi, right, thank you very much. I was actually friends with Aaron for a while, and that was great. Um, the one thing I didn't think you touched on as well as I think you could was is the the rewards for the prosecutors are based on uh, convictions, not necessarily for justice. And there was actually, a, 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 I was watching another documentary about Hugh Hefner, and the Reagan administration actually went after his girlfriend on drug, drug charges. She was convicted, and then she killed herself. So, very similar. Yeah, I mean, look, we have a, we have a broken criminal justice system. I mean, 97% of, of people in our criminal justice system plea out. 3% of cases go, actually go to trial. It's, I think it's absurd to think that 97% of people in our criminal justice system are guilty. 
Um, that can't be the case. Uh, they are, it's either it's too complicated, they don't know their rights, they don't, um, they don't, they don't have representation, it costs money, they're uh, pressured by prosecutors. Uh, it's, it's, this, it's this awful kind of machine of, of despair, really, uh, that's, that, that has caused massive incarceration rates. We have the highest rate of incarceration in the world in this country, 2.3 million people in jails and prisons, another 5 million the control of the criminal justice system. Makes us the, makes us the, wor the worst in the world in that, in that regard, highest rate of incarceration um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree that prosecutors, they're, they're, they get accolades and they get, new, they, get, uh, they get a notch on their belt for convictions, and that's it. We've given them too much, too much power. Thanks. I didn't realize it was 97%. That's insane. Thanks. Yeah, 97% of people on criminal justice will plea out. And, and there's not even a criminal uh, public defender system in all 50 states in America. Most people don't realize that. We think that there's a safety net there that's not there. Uh, first of all, excellent, very moving film, very impactful. Second of all, I, I want to ask a question that I hope the rest of the audience will echo. I personally am a master's in international business student from the University of Florida, but my question is, what can I do to further this cause? What can I do to make sure that we're moving against this sort of incredibly regressive system where we have public domain being taken for private interests and we have people being extorted to the point of ending their own life over matters that ultimately are of property that should be collective and events the collective society. How can I personally get involved? That's a great question. Do you, I have a whole thing on this. <laughs> um, I mean, there, Aaron wasn't alone in lots of the battles that he was fighting for. You saw Peter Eckers lead in the film. He's one of the chief technologists at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and they do lots of good work for open access and for good tech law. Um, Carl Malamud uh, is taking a lot of things that are copyrighted that should be in the public domain and forcing them into the public domain, sort of keeping governmental records and laws uh, out of the hands of people who would charge for them. And there's lots of people who are doing great things. Uh, Fight for the Future, I think someone from them was in the film as well. And you can just, you know, sort of follow this web of tech activists and internet activists and uh, open knowledge activists and see what they're doing, what they're fighting for now, and how you can help. Because there's lots of people out there doing good work. And, and part of, you know, part of what I'm really interested in doing with this film is, uh, is using it in every way we can to, to, to create, create really simple, actually really simple answers to your questions in uh, five things that I've kind of mapped out with the film uh, that, that are just strategic action campaigns that can, that can be kind of simple, straightforward things. So that's part of our effort moving forward, using this uh, film uh, to, to try to push things like Aaron's Law, CFAA reform, wealth disparity, uh, the, the sort of plea bargaining uh, problem I just said, uh, things like that. And uh, I'm, I'm a filmmaker, so I'm, I'm also working with activists and stuff to, to do something beyond just uh, kind of awareness to actually try to change the law. So uh, stay tuned. I guess what I'm saying is stay tuned. In the next couple, couple of months, we hope to have some solid answers to that. Thank you. Can I ask on that note, how you distribute a film like this? Do you have plans for it already? Yeah, we, we've, uh, the big news this week is we uh, partnered with Participant Media, uh, which is, um, which is, uh, I think, a really great, great, uh, really wonderful match, actually. They have uh, already worked with a lot of the groups that Aaron has worked with, like Demand Progress, or found, he founded Demand Progress. Um, and so, and they seem particularly interested in that kind of social outreach. So it, um, that's, it's, it's coming in in June um, uh, theatrically, and then day and day we're doing uh, digitally everywhere too, under a um, uh, non commercial Creative Commons uh, and non ported license. Um, thank you for Hacktivist, first of all. Uh, I want to ask a, 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 a director question. Um, uh, you did not know Aaron before you started making this film. You knew the, the, what the end of the story was going to be making it. I just wondered how you weave your way through in that, without getting caught up in the tragedy, without getting caught up in the anger, without getting caught up with all of those things to make a film that is as seamless and pointed as you have. How did you navigate through all those things? Uh, well, that's a, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I was, uh, I've been paying close attention to this, to this, to a lot of this activity that's been going on in the last couple of years. Um, 
participating in it in some ways, protesting myself to, to some degree. Um, so I, I kind of understood the story in the background. I didn't, I didn't know Aaron. Uh, uh, I never met Aaron. Um, I did. I was keenly aware of his uh, arrest. I was paying very close attention to the arrest of uh, hackers and hacktivists at that point. Barry Brown. And Barry Brown, of course, he's in my other film, and, uh, and uh, of course Jeremy and uh, Weave and all this. Stuff. But what was striking about Aaron's uh, story is that it, it didn't get a lot of press. Uh, not a lot of people knew about it. Um, as opposed to some of those other uh, cases that, you know, hacker cases can get a lot of press. Uh, and I never quite understood that. I never quite understood why it was quieter somehow than, than the rest of it until I started making this documentary and uh, realized that he just, he was quiet about it himself. He, he was worried about the uh, prosecutor kind of backlash uh, if he went forward, which, which turned out to be um, uh, a valid concern uh, once you read the MIT report. But, uh, he purposefully kind of kept it quiet. He was isolated. He didn't want to bring his friends into a prosecution. Uh, he didn't tell a lot of people about it. So that, that I think that's, that's part of the reason why so much happened after his death and not a lot uh, during his life. We just have time for one more question, quickly, if possible. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say to Mr. Schwartz that uh, some of us live a life trying, trying to make an impact on the world. Your brother spent as many minutes as he did for the rest of us. And it's a beautiful thing. Thank you very much for coming out and representing him. <laughs> his life uh, will live way beyond his uh, 26 years, and we're grateful for that. Uh, as a filmmaker, the question would be, uh, when you're directing a film, it's your perspective that you're putting together. Did you have the perspective that the death, as you seem to say in the film, was the result of the case? Or did you come in trying to figure out what it was and then came to the conclusion? I, I came in trying to figure out what it was. And I, and I did come to that conclusion. I, I think that, you know, I think that documentary filmmaking is best when you rigorously explore all viewpoints, uh, including especially uh, contrary and adversarial viewpoints to your own. Um, but I also think that it's a mistake to think that it's not, that there's not a perspective, right? I mean, I have, I learned something, I have a point of view as a result of what I learned, and I'm not going to be shy about saying that point. Uh, that doesn't mean that that, that come. I, I think you, you don't go like to answer your question directly. You don't go into it with that point of view. You go into it as intellectually curious and as rigorous as you and and, and as uh, and as engaged with all points of view as you possibly can. Um, but yeah, I think a good good documentary uh, uh, also has a point of view. Thank you. Please, a big thank you to these guys, and don't forget to vote for the audience.